Podcast with Joe and Dave. Be warned, the discussions in this podcast will contain detailed spoilers. For spoiler free reviews of newly released films, please check out our channel Reviews Without Remorse on YouTube and Vidme. Enter at your own risk and enjoy the show. Some podcasts can review War and Peace and walk away thinking it was a simple adventure story, while other podcasts can review the ingredients on a chewing gum wrapper and unlock the secrets of the universe. This is Reviews Without Remorse. And I am Joe, the greatest criminal mind of our time. Doesn't it kind of give you a shudder of electricity to be in the same room with me? And with me is my partner, who's too good to be true. He's six foot four, has black hair, blue eyes, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, and tells the truth. Dave. This is episode 87. And on this episode, Stephen King's Pet Cemetery gets a remake and we'll review the trailer. Iron Fist season two gets canceled. We'll figure out what happened. Another live action remake from Disney, and this time it's Aladdin. We'll talk about the teaser trailer. And finally, join us as we fight for truth, justice, and the American way. Reviews Without Remorse reviews the original Superman the movie. What's up, my partner? I am fairly impressed that you actually gave me Superman. I would have figured you'd give me Lex Luthor. I, I was going to be Lex Luthor and give you Otis, but I was like, no, nah, I can't do that to him. I can't do that to him. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but I mean, I'm the bald one. You're, you're definitely more in line with Superman than anybody else. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Well, true on the bald part. I don't know about the Superman part. But anyway, here we go. So many trees. It's beautiful, right? That's definitely not Boston. Here we go. Okay, so what do you think? Wow. This whole place is ours? I even got him to throw in a whole forest as a new backyard. So Stephen King's Pet Cemetery gets another round. Uh, what did you think? Okay, so the truth be known, as a translation to the book, the first one was okay. It didn't really catch all the things. And I, I if I'm being completely honest with you, the entire thing with... The kid just didn't work in the movie as well as it worked in the book. In the book, it was absolutely terrifying. In the movie, it was like, okay, kid, just grit your teeth and kind of walk after people with a knife. And it's like <laughs> about, about, about as intimidating as a kitten playing with a ball. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know that's true. <laughs> like he's like, like he's right. He's sitting there like with this make a mean face. It's like, oh, is he cute? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I just wanted to hug the kid. It's like, oh, you want to stab me with the knife? Oh, yeah, it's so cute. Um, this one feels to be. I mean, I hate to say the word gritty reboot because the first one was pretty damn gritty to begin with, but damn, did it look dark and. Look, I loved me Fred Gwynn. I thought he was an amazing, yes, uh, amazing actor <laughs> yeah. uh, for, for for what he did, and I mean, you know, that was like the second part of his career playing, you know, uh, Judd Crandall. But boy, oh boy, talk about casting, John Lithgow. I keep forgetting that sucker has gotten as old as he did. I think he's going to be awesome in the part. Yeah, I, I, I you know, he, he's. He's pretty spot on in pretty much everything he does. Uh, but yeah, boy, that Fred Gwynn, boy, he he really kind of made that first one, didn't he? Yes, he did. He was probably the biggest reason why I enjoyed it as much as I did. I wasn't a big fan of the family, but he was just so charming and personable. Yeah. Uh, the family was kind of bland, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and you need a really good family, which which part of me is a little worried about it because now the family is being led by Jason Clark. Now, he's... And a bit of an uneven actor. He's had some good moments, like in in um, uh, the second Planet of the Apes movie, he was the lead guy, and I thought he was pretty good in that. Uh, and then you have Terminator Genesis, where he plays the, the he plays John Connor, and I don't necessarily know if I can blame him for that, but he was just like so villainy that it was almost comedic. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so, he. I, I totally understand. You know, when I saw the second. Um, Planet of the Apes movie, I had that same vibe. Yeah. Like it, it almost felt like this cast was like a made for TV cast and not not did not have the cinematic punch that that movie deserved. Mm, indeed. Uh but 
on the other side of the coin, he did just recently play Ted Kennedy in Chappaquiddick, and oh, yeah. I actually thought he was good. I actually thought he was really good in that. You know what? I didn't even make the connection. You know what? I saw Chappaquiddick. I loved it. Thought it was very well done. I, and I, I did, kinda, too. You know, I was so spellbound, I kind of forgot that was even him. But yeah. yeah, boy, he was. You're absolutely right. He was terrific in that, wasn't he? Yep. So if he if he gets this part down well, and from what little we've seen in the trailer, it's really hard to judge. It could be very very effective. Mm. Uh, the the vibe is creepy. Um, the the little added thing of the kids doing the, the the funeral procession with the mask and stuff like that that was another layer of creepiness that wasn't necessarily in the book, but I kind of felt welcomed to it. Yeah, I'm. Kind of looking forward to this particular yeah. remake. I didn't think the first one was all that great. So, you know, my, my feeling on remakes is I'm, I'm always against it unless, like, the first one just had some misses that, you know what, maybe a remake might do this some good. Yeah, I, I'd say this one's a little more fair game because, honestly, I, you know, I mean, we're, we're living in the, the time of if it's not nailed down, we're going to remake it. Uh, mm-hmm. But but since this is based on a book, I kind of feel like that sort of gets a little more of a pass. Um so yeah, I, I, I can and, and I, honestly this I would say this we said before that the best movies to really remake are the ones that were near misses. You know what I yeah. mean? The mediocre ones. I would say this qualifies. So 100%. if they could do if they could do better this time, then great. It's being directed by uh, Dennis Widmere and Kevin Kulsh. Now, they don't really have a big illustrious career ahead of them. They've done some short films. They did a documentary on Chuck Palahniuk, which now that I'm seeing it, I'm kind of curious about. Yeah. And they did a couple of episodes of the TV series Scream, which, by the way, today I just found out that there's a TV series for Scream. <laughs> so there we go. Um, yeah, no, um, I, I'm I'm kind of digging the look of it. I'm th- I'm kind of digging the feel of it, and I, you know, I'm hopeful. I'm being hopeful here. I am the Iron Fist. The hell does that mean? My friend, what is going on over there with Iron Fist? So the first season of um, Iron Fist was a dud. I'm just going to come out and say it. It was was okay, but it had some choices in it that if I were the showrunner, I'd want to kick my own ass over. (laughs) Uh, The constant mentioning of I'm the immortal Iron Fist has become like a meme at this point. Uh, that it, but basically it did its job. It led into Defenders. Defenders was, you know, pretty good and everything. So the second season comes along, and honestly, I really didn't have a lot of hope for it, and I really, really found myself enjoying it a lot more than the first season. I liked the character of the Iron Fist for the first time as compared to the first season where I liked the character of Colleen Wing more than the character of Iron Fist. I, I felt the story had great progression, it had some nice shocking moments, some good surprises, and it left it open to an ending that excited me. And I was like, wow, you know, they're actually going to go down this path. That's great. I can't wait to see that. Mm. Well, it seems that the first season poisoned the well because the second season didn't do as well as the first. And Netflix has decided to cancel Iron Fist, mm. not give it a season three. Now, they're saying that the character of Iron Fist isn't gone, which, of course, means he could show up in Heroes for Hire. He could show up in Daredevil, which, by the way, Daredevil premieres this Friday. Your ass better be ready for that. Nice. White yeah. suit Wilson Fisk. White suit Wilson <laughs> Fisk. <laughs> yeah, that looks Sorry. pretty sweet. I'm uh, very excited about that. You know, I got to admit, I it's funny you say that because, honestly, I didn't even realize that they had done a season two. In fact, in my opening, I kind of screwed up and I said season two got canceled. I didn't even realize they did a season two. So oh, yeah. that's how, that, I mean, but but it was so under advertised. I, I, I mean, I'm already seeing the trailers for Daredevil season three all over the place. I saw nothing. I didn't even know that they had one for season two. They had a very busy year in the Marvel Netflix world. They had season two of Jessica Jones. They had season two of um, Luke Cage. And they had season two of Iron Fist all in a row. And now they're capping it off with season three of Daredevil. Mm. That's busy, even for Netflix, as far as I'm concerned. I th- Honestly, I, I I think they're mismarketing this because I, I honestly didn't even see any of those. I, I saw, I mean, I saw the first two seasons of Daredevil. I saw the first season of Jessica Jones. I saw the most of the first season of Iron Fist. And then I kind of, not Iron Fist, excuse me, Luke Cage. And then I kind of 
uh, petered out. And I hadn't even gotten around to Defenders yet. And I didn't even know that they had done the other ones. So, yeah, I, I like I said, I, I kind of feel like that's a failure on their part to, to market it. Agreed. I also think it was run very poorly uh, in the first season by, uh, I, I forget the guy's name, but he also, he went from Iron Fist season one to doing the uh, Marvel's Inhumans TV show, yeah. which was just god freaking awful. <laughs> So long, Iron Fist. Yeah, sorry to, to see, see you it. go. It's, it's, a little, it's a little unceremonious, but, um, well. Aladdin, the next in another line of Disney live-action remakes, and uh, I think you and I probably have already kind of hit our, um, you know, our patience is a little thin, running thin for these movies, so. There is only one reason I'm curious about this movie. Directed by Guy Ritchie. That's it. Um, Okay. Fair enough. That's it. Guy Ritchie can be uneven, but when he hits, he's usually not so bad. Yeah. But on the other side of the coin, Will Smith is playing the genie, and it's like, look, no offense, Will Smith, you are no Robin Williams, and you need to stop pretending like you are. <laughs> the trailer is basically nothing but a teaser. It shows um, the, 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 the Cave of Wonder... And a CGI animated lion head saying, search for the diamond in the rough. And it sounds like they're still using Frank Welker's voice for the cave, which is great. Uh, and then a quick shot of Aladdin reaching for the lamp. There's really not much to it. It is a teaser in the teaser uh, respect. But it's just, I don't know, man. It's 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 It feels soulless. And weirdly, it's got that... It's got that Guy Ritchie vibe, like Guy Ritchie from like Sherlock Holmes vibe that just makes me feel like, oh, it's going to be like super ultra hyper realistic or whatever, you know, term we, we were referring it to. Yeah. Where it just, I don't know. I, I don't know. It, well, I don't know. you know, in this situation, it might actually, it might be a little, it might benefit a little from a little more realism. And and again, I, I it's not that I'm it's not that I'm eager and excited for it, regardless. But I, honestly, that again, we talked about the Beauty and the Beast, and I watched that. And I'm just like I, I I'm saying to myself, why am I why is this made? Why is it here? I mean, the Jungle Book, I the other ones were great. That Maleficent I thought was very interesting. They they really had a fascinating take on that, and I thought that was really well done because it was a different spin on the familiar story. Jungle Book mm. was more or less a retelling, but the environment, I thought, it really kind of lent itself to what that was. But then when I got around to doing Beauty and the Beast, and it was just a, a, a shot-for-shot remake almost, I'm like, why am I watching this? The, what's the point of this? So, yeah, at, at least the Jungle Book remake added elements from the book back into it right. uh, to keep it relatively fresh. Yeah, uh, Agreed, agreed, yeah. And, I mean, and just the look and feel of it, you know it, that that kind of had I, I mean again you, you wouldn't have a small child in the jungle in his bare feet running around doing these things so in that respect i thought it made a lot of sense not to mention that the the voice work was great and all that stuff but again once they got to beating the beast it was just it was like just a, a remake shot for shot it was i mean it's almost like watching the um the gus van sant version of psycho you know like why <laughs> why you know, like i don't get the point of it um so yeah, here here they're doing another one, and I'm kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know. So I'm not expecting anything, and but so yeah, I mean, put some twist on it. If you're gonna do something with it, um, you know, a boy living in that part of the world or a young man living in that part of the world, it could it, there could be a little edginess to it, possibly. So we'll see.
In the decade of the 1930s, even the great city of Metropolis was not spared the ravages of the worldwide depression. In the times of fear and confusion, the job of informing the public was the responsibility of the Daily Planet, a great metropolitan newspaper whose reputation for clarity and truth had become a symbol of hope for the city of Metropolis. is sent from his dying planet to Earth, where he grows up to become his adoptive home's first and greatest superhero. Written by Mario Puzo, David Newman, Leslie Newman, and Robert Benton. Story by Mario Puzo. Based on characters created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Directed by Richard Donner. The godfather of superhero movies, <laughs> Superman the Movie. <laughs> Isn't it funny in retrospect hearing it called Superman the movie as if like like this was a time when that the idea that Superman was actually on the big screen was such a a, a big deal that you actually had to yeah. sort of clarify that this is a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And differentiate it from the infamous, well, I'm sorry, infamous made it sound bad, the, the famous TV show right. with George Reeves. Sure. Yeah. This, you know, we've used the term lightning in a bottle on many occasions and it's it almost feels cliche to use it but if there was ever an example a true example of lightning in a bottle this is it right here mm. where everything fired on all cylinders where all the casting was pitch perfect where the writing just found its voice early easily and flowed beautifully where the directing was wonderfully you know, framed, wonderfully pushed, wonderfully photographed. The special effects, even to this day, the special effects still hold up. Yeah, not as much as it did back in 78, 100%. You can see lines here, there, and everywhere, but you gotta give it to like Reeve and to Donner for when they're doing those special effects scenes. Like, you know, yeah, we know that basically Christopher Reeve's just waving his arms to make it look like he's flying, but they made it work, yeah. man. And he looked just so... It, he, he, Superman. Christopher <laughs> Reeve was Superman. And there has not been better since. This is a beautiful, wonderful movie. And I'm so glad after the tripe we've had to deal with the past couple of weeks <laughs> that we're cleansing our palate with this beautiful thing. Yeah, I completely wholeheartedly agree. This is going to be another uh, gush fest from Reviews Without Remorse. And uh, I apologize if that's boring, but this this absolutely positively is a masterpiece. And I, I know I just recently used that word for Raiders. This is another one. And frankly, I feel like probably of the two, this one I find to be more underrated. Uh, I think I mean, I think everybody acknowledges that this is kind of the gold standard when it comes to superhero films. Uh, it's it's it like you said it's lightning on, in a bottle that they, they could not recapture since uh, no one has been able to recapture it in fact the only thing that I think even comes close frankly uh, would be Wonder Woman where they acknowledged that this was the gold standard and they pay, pay tribute and and took mm -hmm. the lessons from this film um, the right lessons as opposed to yeah. the lessons that Brian Singer took with Superman Returns which we'll get into in about three more movies oh yeah uh, yeah, and I and frankly, it's funny. You mentioned the, the special effects, and and it's I mean, for a film from nineteen from this from the seventies, 
I mean, I think the yeah. effects hold up better than uh, Temple of Doom. I mean, we talk, you know, Go, certainly much do better. Certainly do. Uh, yeah. I, and, and 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 ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for interrupting, but here's something you need to note. In 1977, when Star Wars was made, the reason why we have industrial light and magic is that most special effects shops in Hollywood had closed down. They had to make their own special effects division to do the special effects for Star Wars. Yeah. So Superman is really an amazing product of its time because there weren't many special effects shops in Hollywood at the time mm. that could do these types of things. They were working really on the fly. Guerrilla warfare special effects with this movie. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And it's it's funny when you look back, and I mean, even at the time or, not, or, or soon afterwards, I remember thinking that the tagline at the time, you will believe a man can fly. I remember thinking like, well, how strange is that? Because I mean, I mean, for example... Uh, the Wizard of Oz was out, you know, how many years before that? 40 years prior. Uh, and I frankly had no problem believing that the Wicked Witch was flying. But but again, that was pretty tame. Like there was they didn't really they didn't highlight that as you know, it wasn't like it wasn't a big feature of the film. This was like a, a, a feature film where like there was a big, big chunk of this movie just dedicated to watching Superman fly. And mm. uh, and it's true at the time. These effects were groundbreaking, and and not long before that, you it would have looked very hokey. Here, it, they really do pull it off pretty spectacularly. Uh, I, like I said, I mean, it's, it's not flawless by any stretch, but still, I mean, honestly, it was it was the kind of thing. I, I mean, the visuals combined with the magnificent score, which I will gush about soon. Um, I mean, <laughs> honestly, this really got your blood pumping. You know, I mean, it was it was realistic enough that you could totally get into it. The first time you see Superman fly is he's just created the, the Fortress of Solitude. Yeah. Uh, teenage Superman, is, uh, uh, Clark Kent, has gone there. He's talking with his father. His father is going over, telling him about you know the history, about you know it is forbidden to interfere with human history, all that stuff. And then it kind of zooms back into the present, making it seem like he's just gone this amazing journey to learn and so on and so forth. And there's Christopher Reeve. All in that gorgeous damn costume that that son of a gun, yep. he just filled it out beautifully, didn't he? Sure did. <laughs> and then he just lifts up and quite naturally and flawlessly just moves around the Fortress of Solitude and takes off and goes up. Yeah. And I remember my nine-year-old self looking at that thinking, oh! Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And not for nothing, you know, as... As advanced as today's effects are, honestly, something really does get lost. Because when you watch the effects in this film, and it's, again, it's not just... Like, when you watch that scene where it's the big re public reveal of Superman, right? When he, he rescues Lois Lane, the helicopter crashes on the side of the building, and he takes mm -hmm. off. I mean, the shot alone of her... There's a shot of her when she first... Like, again, she's hanging on. And she's genuinely hanging on to that thing, Right. Yeah. And she drops. There's a shot. Not only do they show her drop, but there's sort of like another shot that where, where the camera's trying to sort of follow her down as she's genuinely free falling, right? I mean, she's, I mean, she's obviously her or somebody is dropping into, uh, you know, like a, a uh, you know, an airbag. And, but, the, but you see the camera sort of struggle to follow her, right? And between that and some of the great wire work in this, it's like, so many films now, they don't have that realism, that sense of realism that only comes from being forced to do things in a practical way. Like now mm -hmm. everybody, I mean, I mean, people flying all around, like, I mean, every Marvel movie. And again, I'm not certainly not mocking, you know, not knocking the Marvel movies by any stretch. But I mean, again, it's so easy now to have somebody flying around that you lose some of that feel that you get when you first watch Christopher Reeve dressed as Superman first take flight. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's it's lost a lot of its it's lost a lot of its organic nature. Uh, without the actual, if the best actors in the world can still react better to actually having that motion as opposed to just in a green screen and reacting or having some CGI version of that character land and stuff like that, right. it's just it's just that much better. You need the physical actions to go along with it, and it just it fits in perfectly. Right. And you know, even the little things that uh, uh, Christopher Reeve did, like during the big 
big scene at the end. One of my favorite shots is where he's diving out of the sky and his hands are in front of him and he kind of just like swims his hands out to the side yeah. and then just kind of puts his one hand forward and like pushes forward. I love that shot. Yeah. And it is really not, it's not the most awesome shot in the movie. There are tons of that, but there's something about that, just the way he just flowed so naturally that it really made me believe that like, this guy knows what the hell he's doing to fly. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And honestly, uh, like there's a shot of him after that scene, after he rescues Lois Lane for the first time, and he's mm -hmm. kind of flying with the twin towers in the background, and he's like he's just sort of flying around and he's sort of twisting around upside down, and then the camera, the background, sort of does the same. Like it, it's kind of twisting around upside down. You're absolutely right. There's something absolutely magnificent about the simplicity of that shot. Something that you would never see today. I mean, now in the days of watching Henry Cavill, every time he lands. Boom! You like you know, yeah. <laughs> smashes down on the ground with his earth shuddering. You know, like really, why would Superman do that? Why would he do that? He would land gently, like Christopher Reeve does. I don't. But anyway, I, I said so another thing. You just I never quite get. But yeah, you're. I mean, there's so many things now that they do in in the original Superman that that now is so taken for granted that you 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 forget the majesty that that first film had. And the general love and awe of the character. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the way, you know, everything transitioned to itself. No character in this movie was wasted. Every single character served Agreed. a purpose at some, at some point or another. Sure. You know, people talk about, you know, Al Lois Lane, the professional, the professional uh, uh, woman in peril. Right. It's like, no, okay, first of all, she's mostly putting herself in that peril nine times out of ten because she's, you know, the reporter that she is. Yeah. And I don't think it detracted from her character at all. I think that you're being a little oversensitive if you think that that's the case. Mm. Uh, I, I I don't buy that for a second. But no, I don't either. Uh, in, in fact, again, uh, we're going we're like seriously, like you know, um, strong female leads. Like again, she was a completely fleshed out, flesh and blood character. You know, I mean, she had her own personality. She had her own motivation. It was, I mean, it was, it was absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, help, Miss Tessmacher. Got an arc for God's sake, right? Miss Tessmacher. <laughs> yep, Miss Tessmacher. The only person that maybe, the, maybe the only person that didn't get an arc is like Otis, but Otis is just <laughs> the dim-witted henchman, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I totally agree. But oh, but we but talk about like an acting caliber, uh, 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 an amazing range of acting. You start off with Marlon Brando, who got paid at the time stupid amount of money yeah. for 15 minutes of Jor-El. Yeah. Uh, but th come on, in a way, I don't necessarily know if he was worth the money, but the man really did put a lot into it. I bought him as this, as, as this, you know, no, no, it's, you know, we will not leave Krypton, you know, yeah, in, yeah. except for the bad pronunciation of Krypton. Yeah. I loved him in that part. And he, to me, is the benchmark of jor -El. And then let's talk about the second. Now, this is, I'm going in order of how they're built. You start yeah. with Marlon Brando, the guy with the least amount of screen time, top build. Then you go to Gene Hackman. Bless this man. <laughs> totally. Bless this man. Totally. And his wonderful, unparalleled, maybe save for the animated series and Clancy Brown voicing him, unparalleled Lex Luthor to this very day. Absolutely. He He's funny. Honestly, I mean, seriously, as I'm doing my opening, I made myself Lex Luthor because honestly... I mean, as magnificent as Superman is as a character and as uh, I remember watching this film f even even much younger, just being mesmerized by Lex Luthor and well, by, by Gene Hackman's portrayal of Lex Luthor. I thought he I mean, he's I mean, they played him as being amazingly intelligent, yet funny, witty. I mean, he, I mean, I'm, the script is magnificent. I, I mean, that kind of mm -hmm. I kind of feel like it almost goes without saying, but it should be highlighted that the screenplay is absolutely i think perfect i mean i literally think this is one of those and again i mean you had mario puzo the writer of the godfather doing the story and the screenplay uh the other people who contributed to the screenplay i mean i think this this story treatment is absolutely magnificent and the epicness the ep the sweeping epic feel of this movie is just so amazing frankly i mean and this is why i say 
I think this is this, this movie is so underrated because I mean not only do they give Superman a realistic feel I mean and, and again it's so funny I, sh- I, sh- I don't mean to keep fast forwarding to today but when they keep kind of talking about gritty and realis- realistic I'm like well, I don't know what you people are talking about Superman the movie is the most realistic I think portrayal that this character has ever seen uh, he takes place in a world that I feel like we could step out right now and go visit or especially at the time uh, I mean the fact that they they start in Krypton they they move to the sweeping plains of Kansas, you know, and then finally move into Manhattan, which, again, per, you know, is playing Metropolis, which was perfect. I mean, the idea that they mm-hmm. would use the New York Times building as the Daily Planet building is, frankly, a, a spot of genius. Um, I mean, they really did give this film such an amazing, epic feel. And even when you look at, like, the the first scenes on Krypton, now, it's funny, like, I kind of feel like today people would sort of look at that and kind of go, eh, I thought the way they treated that, the way that was handled with a screenplay that was almost mysterious, it was almost, um, it was sort of done with kind of a broad brush in a way, like it's very nonspecific in a way that you don't know a lot about this civilization it's done in a very interesting way where they, they, they paint you a picture of this civilization. Uh, again, in, in a way that makes you sort of just just buy it. You know what I mean? For lack of a better way to say it. So much so that I find that if I watch... like This is something I want to mention too. There's actually other versions out now. There's like the, the and that, like two and a half hours, which I th- was something... When they first showed it on television, they threw in a couple extra scenes. And right. yeah, okay. They're like some of them are okay. There's actually a, a version out now that I bought not that long ago. I, I've I've actually been watching this movie a few times late, right, recently. It's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> but I watched a three hour. There's a three hour cut now. Uh, oh and honestly, I don't recommend it. I, I think if people watch this, just watch the two hour cut because it it is cut so perfectly. And honestly, I really feel like this is one of those cases like Star Wars where the film was kind of almost rescued in the editing room. I mean, the basic mm-hmm. story is still intact when you watch the longer version. But there's so much more time given to things that didn't really need it that it almost it's like you're watching a magic trick in slow motion and, and you're starting to sort of see behind the scenes a little bit too much or start to see things, see the cracks in, in the so yeah, stick to the original cut. Don't bother with the long ones. They're, they don't really lend anything. In fact, I mean, and, and the reason why I kind of got off on that tangent was because there are they do a very expanded Krypton scene, and I feel like it kind of ruins some of the mystery. And I think the way they do it in the final cut is perfect, where they give you just enough of that society that you you, you kind of go, okay, all right, I get it. Um, but yeah, and then when they get they, they the whole rest of the span of the film, the the life of of Superman from birth to to to, to today, I mean, I, I think it's just so well done. It's so well done, and honestly, it's just believable in a in a in a in a way that it's hard to explain. You know, we we talked again, and the way Superman is played, the only thing I the only comparison I have, and you and I have talked about it before, is Captain America how they were able to successfully do that in the Marvel Captain America because they stayed faithful to the character as opposed to DC that would get cold feet and say, oh, no, you can't do that today. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And especially in 1978, where you're talking about post-Vietnam, post-Watergate, all that stuff, it was not a, a um, not an op- um, optimistic thank time. Thank you. <laughs> not an optimistic time in the world. So it that's why this movie rang so true to people. It's also the reason why Star Wars rang true. It was yeah. a dark time. The 70s were a dark time for people and movies with hope were embraced by the public because we needed some hope. Yeah. It, there's nothing wrong with celebrating hope. I totally agree. And and also by the way, now that you mentioned it too, I this film I sort of compare this film to not only Star Wars, but actually Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. Because I kind of feel like this film, it fulfills everything it sets out to do so masterfully. It, it is a 
perfect hero's journey. And and again, it's amazing to me why people say, oh, you can't write for Superman because what are you talking about? This is one of the most masterful films ever. Uh, I mean, this is this is a true a true journey of a hero. And and the thing the, the way that they the things sort of come together, it's just absolutely amazing. And honestly, I kind of feel like it's it's the masterful story structure of Star Wars, plus that that beautiful screenplay that Empire has, combined with the fact, by the way, that this was like Empire. This was a, a story where the filmmakers are struggling to do the best film that they can do while you have penny-pinching producers telling them to speed it up, don't spend so much money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this was a film, I mean, again, and you, you, we will get to this next week and beyond, uh, where, you know, things start to fall apart because of that. But this film, I mean, th- this is a, a, a vision, a creative vision that is unmatched. An extremely solid foundation for what was planned to be a two part movie from the beginning. The first time yep. in film history that two movies were planned at once. Yep. And uh, which led to some interesting side effects for the sequel. But like you said, we will get to that. Now, we need to talk about the character of Clark Kent. Yeah. uh, yeah. Portrayed perfectly as a teenager by a young actor by the name of Jeff East, who I absolutely positively could see as a young Christopher Reeve. Mm. They give him, you know, they, 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 they give him that that conflicted nature without overdoing it. They show, they don't tell. Yeah. They remind you that he can do all these things. And when Jonathan Kent dies and they're at the, the grave and they're like, oh, you know, all my powers and I couldn't save him. I mean, you in a span of 10 minutes, maybe even less than that. I think the entire sequence is less than eight minutes from there he is in high school. He's being picked on. He could absolutely take care of it. His father tells him you're here for a bigger, better reason. Father dies. My God, I couldn't save him even with all my powers in the span of like seven. That is a mini character arc in seven minutes. Masterfully told. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. I mean, absolutely positively. You're, you're right. And again, compare, you want to compare it to today where they, they, you know, what am I supposed to do? Let him they die? Go, oh, baby. I mean, again, yeah, not on the a, nose. A this was monologue. <laughs> yeah. And and on the nose, you know, not 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 something with the finesse that this one has. I mean, this is a father talking to his son the way fathers should would. Um mm-hmm. yeah, I mean it's it is absolutely brilliant and it and it takes you through that time in his life and it makes and again, it's not just kind of like it, it's not the and then syndrome. This whole part of his his upbringing goes full circle at the end when he has the flashback, yes. all those things I could do. And I couldn't. And he's like, I'm not sitting around for that again. You know, and he takes things into his own hands. Um, yeah. I mean, I honestly, I, I really do believe that this is one of the greatest, I think, screenplays of all time. You, Oof. you know, when you, when you really think about the epic scope of this film, and just think about how it how it all works, how it all comes together. I mean, I think this is a masterful film. I mean, I, I don't think even the best superhero films of today. Uh, I mean, I would say that Iron Man, the first Iron Man, is a spot on kind of a, a story. But hmm. even then, I don't think it has the ambition that this first f- Superman film has. And to to try to do something with this kind of a scope and to be able to pull it off. I mean, I mean there's moments of this this movie that are like gone with the wind. I mean, you talk I mean you really are talking about a sweeping epic. Um I mean it is it is to, to say that this is like just uh, just a superhero. Oh, you you're totally missing the point. I mean, this is masterfully done. Yeah, little things like the the heist to put the codes in the, the <laughs> missiles. Yeah. To, to take it over, you know, nice little side diversions, giving you story, a little bit of comedy, relatively naturally done uh, comedy. Always loved Larry Hagman's um, cameo in that one scene. Yeah. You know, that. <laughs> I, I guess my I'm arm sorry. wasn't long enough, Mister Luthor. <laughs> you want to see a real long arm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, seriously, and that's the kind of thing too. By the way, like especially when you're younger. Like you know, I just want to see Superman fly around and do and do super stuff. Those scenes there, 
never bored me at all, e- even when I was much no. younger, because they were so well done. They were so fun. I mean, they were genuinely funny. They were generally good, to, you know, interesting to watch. And yeah, I mean, just, just yeah, I mean, all of that was so great. The, even even like the subtle little things, I like how as the movie went along, it gave you an idea of what his powers were and what he could do and everything like that. Yeah. Like at no point did they really like emphasize that he ha- that he had super hearing until Lex Luthor reached out to him and gave him that wonderful monologue that brought him to his uh, thing, yes. to 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 his secret base. Yeah. I liked that. I like that the way his his powers slowly you know, got revealed was all situational based and not just, you know, just, Oh look, here he is practicing and look, I can do this. Look, I can do that. Remember that for later. You know, these were things like, no, you know, if people are coming to this movie, we know who Superman is when each thing, when he does each of these things, it should be like a huge moment. Yeah. And that's what it was treated like every time a new power of his came out. And even, even like subtle little things like, God, Another one of my favorite shots in that movie is, you know, during the big earthquake near the end, the train is coming up to the trestle and it's it's collapsed and he just kind of run, he flies down, he puts his hand on the track, yeah. lifts up the, the bar and then just puts his head down. The train just goes right over him. Yeah. Holy moly, even as a kid, I was squirming right? in my seat in glee. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, it, it is it is absolutely masterful. Um but you know, but but out of that, there's also wonderful little character beats, beautiful little character beats, uh, uh, things that you know call back to each other. Uh, you know, him when when um, uh, Lois makes fun of him, you know, oh, you're gonna send your money to a, a little <laughs> white haired yeah. old lady yes. uh, back home, and he just nonchalantly in such a Clark way. Actually, she's silver haired. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I, I love that. I love that little callback. Um, I love even like the most. It, it's a ridiculous sounding line. You got me. Who's got you? Now, yes. as we've demonstrated in the Batman and Robin review, you know, a simple line like "I've got you" can come across <laughs> really, really bad. Yeah. But bless you, Margot Kidder, you sold it totally. So wonderful. Yes, I yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, no oh, crap. I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, Sorry. Don't worry, I'll fix it in post. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I love about that, by the way, and this is something that is so lacking in superhero films today, all superhero films, uh, whether it's it's the good ones from Marvel or the, the, the schlock coming from you know Sony or wherever else, one of the things that, that always frustrates me is that this film has Superman rescuing people and doing mm-hmm. good deeds, you know what I mean? But and but, but and rest, rest, like I heard a reviewer talk about Iron Man three, and the scene where the people fall out of the airplane and they kind of do the barrel of monkeys to, to rescue everybody. Yeah. And, and I and the reviewer kind of said something, and I was like, boy, that is so spot on. He's like, you know, one of the things I love about that scene is that you hardly ever see scenes these days of superheroes rescuing people. And he's like, mm-hmm. and I and I don't know. I mean, it's it's all about the the, the super villains and squaring off against the big super villains. It's it's all about fighting the super villains. But you never get just a scene of people getting rescued. This one has that, and it's got it in spades. And I and I remember thinking like, for years thinking, well, that's what a superhero movie is 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 a, a superhero rescuing people for the most part, and and you know some big climax at the end. But nowadays, it's like that it, they don't do that at all, frankly. And I find it to be very strange, really. It is disheartening, to say the least. Uh, yeah, I actually really enjoyed that scene from Iron Man 3. I think we both actually mentioned yeah. it in our review of it as well. Mm. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was nice to see. It was creative. And it doesn't happen very often. I mean, there were in the first Avengers movies, there were a couple of shots of them saving people. And in Age of Ultron, again, there were a couple of shots of that. But not much, right? And not very often, you know. It was it's it's always like almost secondary, just kind of a reminder of don't worry, we're trying to take care of the people too. Exactly. Whereas yeah. Here, whereas here, it just feels like you know I've got power. I'm going to do the right thing as much as I can. I'm going to grab this guy who's climbing the building with the suction cups. <laughs> I'm going to get on this boat. And just kind of stand there looking gloriously with his arms crossed and the cape flapping in the wind and the World Trade Center behind oh him. My God, the right. guy coming up behind him with the freaking crowbar. Yeah. God. <laughs> so great. Um, all right. here I'm going to throw this out there, by the way. 
Uh, and this, we might even call this the elephant in the room. The oh the first date with Lois Lane, the can you read my mind sequence. You know, people give that scene crap. I don't understand why. Y- you know what? I'm glad you said that. Uh, it's funny you said that because honestly, I was what I was going to say is, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, it's OK. It doesn't bother me or it. I genuinely like that scene. I, it's, it's, it's not just that it gets a pass. I mean, I genuinely like it and I really like what it is because again, what, first of all, you have to sort of understand that in, in a lot of ways, this film to me is almost one of the last films of the last era of movie making before <laughs> the modern era. For lack mm-hmm. of a better way to say it, I kind of feel like even maybe like is Superman two and three almost feels just a little more in the present day slightly than the original Superman. You can see it in the costumes. You can see it in a lot of ways. I mean, it definitely feels a little older. Um, And this to me was something of a different era. And it's done as, I mean, you're trying to convey the idea that somebody meeting this person, a Lois Lane, who is meeting a being from another galaxy who can literally fly around with her. How do you express the idea that this is so just out of the realm of possibility in a way that this would feel almost more like a dream than real life? Mm. This sequence does that. It absolutely positively does that. And I do, I I find it to be a beautiful scene, frankly. It's, it's, it's kind of, um, it sort of takes you out of the movie a little bit. It takes you out of real life, but that's the intent before it puts you back, you know? And I, I, again, I genuinely enjoy this scene. I think it really does work. It doesn't bother me at all. I think the, the I mean, the score is absolutely beautiful. That, that goes without saying, um, yeah. this piece of music and the, the, the words that go along with it and, and, this, and what you're watching, I, I really find it to be a beautiful, beautiful moment in cinema. And I, again, it, I, it's not just that I, eh, it's okay. No, I genuinely do like that as part of this film. This is one of those cases where I'm glad they made the choice. They did. There is a song that was sung by a professional singer that was supposed to overlay that scene. And I love that. Instead, they had Margot Kidder just doing like a tone poem type reading of the song lyrics instead. Yeah. That much, much better choice, I think, than if they would have put the romantic song in there. This scene is a scene of two people finding each other and falling for each other. What the hell is wrong with taking a breath for two people to 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 find each other? Yeah. There is nothing in, in, in any context. This scene to me is more romantic than the entirety of the Twilight Saga movies. <laughs> All right. Come at me, Twilight fans. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, seriously, can you think of a coupling in a, in any superhero movie that worked in in, in this type of context? Right. It was nearly silent for a good four minutes for the sequence as they're flying around, and there is more, you know, tension. There is more Absolutely. chemistry in 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 the silent scenes that just get. As far as I'm concerned, it's almost like the the tone, her talking to him in her mind is like the exclamation point at the end of the scene. Just, you know, her yeah. trying to come to grips with what, what are you? Yeah. You're just, you're just amazingly too good to be true. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of tension, by the way, I love, love, love the fact that they kept the tension going strong throughout the entire film. There is literally yes. not... There's no actual kiss between Lois Lane and Superman. The the fact that like they get there's like that moment right at the end after, you know, he's turned back. I mean, you know, turn the whole world backwards just to rescue her. And there's that moment where it's almost going to happen and it gets interrupted. And that is brilliant because you kept that romantic tension alive and well throughout the entire film. You know, I mean, that was so well done. 100%. 100%. And actually he did kiss her. He gave her when he when when he when she's dead and he pulls her out of the car for a brief right, second. Okay. He gives her a kiss and then she kind of starts slumping and oh god, bless yeah. you Christopher Reeve. Right. The way he's like, oh, you know, like, you know, just trying to gently put her down like she's this fragile little thing. And Henry Cavill, that's how you do an anguished cry. 
<laughs> there you go. Oh my god. No I mean offense, you know the, and the part too, the part when he takes off at the end of that 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 ear shattering echo you know, echoing yell, that cry out as he takes off before he turns the world backwards. <laughs> so well done because like you said i mean they, they like the, the music fades out like they, they they there's there's a long there's long shots and silence so then when it when it erupts back into action with that moment i mean that is such that is such an emotional moment so jarring and so wonderfully wonderfully played i mean god the expression on his face when he took to the air was the first time i was ever like if set thought to myself Dude, if Superman ever went bad, we'd be so screwed. <laughs> right. My friends, I'm not given to wild, unsupported statements. And I tell you that we must evacuate this planet immediately. Jorel, be reasonable. Oh, God. Hey, you know what? We don't, we haven't talked a lot about the two what i feel are the two key things that made this movie what it is for good um you've mentioned it a couple of times we absolutely have to give it up to the incredible john williams oh for my god the most epic 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 superhero scores epic scores let me take out the word superhero yeah. And just say epic scores of all time. Yes. Where five notes are easily still the most instantly recognizable notes in movie history. Yep. I I completely agree. And not only that, I think this has got to be John Williams' best score ever. And he has some stiff competition. I mean, he he is he from is, himself too. Exactly. <laughs> that's what I mean. I mean, he is his own competition. I uh, Star Wars, magnificent. Raiders, even better. This one, I think, is easily his best work. It is so magnificent that I honestly, I wish I could communicate music better. Like, I wish I understood how it works better to be able to explain just how much I think this 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 score is so incredible. There are so many moments in the score of this film that I genuinely say to myself, it, like it's almost like I don't understand his choice to do it. Uh, the, the, like there's parts when like at the, in the big climax when he's flying from one thing to the other, and there's just these these funny little music beats that that connect like the connective tissue between the scenes. And I mm -hmm. say to myself like, I'm so glad I wasn't hired to make the score for that movie because I'd be sitting there going you know dun 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 dun, 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 dun. like everything has to be her this big heroic music <laughs> here. It's heroic in a, in a in a in a a different kind of a way, and it, and it, it communicates in a way that I really can't get my head around. But I I mean I when I was younger, I had the albums honestly. To, I mean this one and then the, the <laughs> Superman too, and I would listen to them like a lot, and just genuinely loved this music. You know I mean it was it's just it is so good. There was like I said there are beats in this in this film that I absolutely positively adore. And like I said, I this man understands music on a, on a level that I will never understand it. You know, I mean, you're I, like, you're like, he's like Mozart, and you're Salieri. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> um, I completely, I hate to hate to interrupt you. Sorry about that, but I completely agree with you. It was the two, this and the Star Wars soundtrack were the two that made me realize that music and movies can be as important to the storytelling process as anything else, and in some cases, maybe even more so. Yeah. Uh, the only other movie I could think of where the music made a huge difference would be would be Halloween, the original Halloween by John Carpenter. Uh, yeah. But that's a story for another time. This is the pinnacle of movie music, and there is no finer example of how to score a movie than this movie. There is a reason we say this is lightning in the bottle and a masterpiece, because every single engine is running perfectly yeah. in the final result of the movie. I completely agree. The, the other thing I want to—I I have to bring up before we get to the re, to the score because we have to get to the score. Let's give it up to the greatest Superman ever, Mr. Christopher Reeve. I need to mention him. I cannot gush about him more. <laughs> I, I completely agree. I, I completely agree, and I can't imagine 
this film with any other actor. Uh, he no. is unparalleled. He, I mean, th there's a part of me that is as magnificent as he is. I almost wonder, like, is it even worth mentioning? So, like, in my mind, he was just sort of born to play this part. You yes. know, like, he is such a natural at. Superman and I and I have to give it again to the filmmakers who were smart enough like we talked about Brando how he's barely in it and uh, Gene Hackman he, Gene Hackman is, is incredible he was the he was the other big name actor they were very very wise to cast those parts with with big famous actors who would lend gravitas to this film but smart enough to get an unknown to play Superman and I think that was such a smart move and the proof is the proof is right there on the screen and the fact that they were able to find this unknown Christopher Reeve such a smart such a smart move such a, a magnificent casting choice and and yeah he is absolutely incredible 40 years later he is still many people's superman he many, he will always be son. he will always be my superman he will never be n nobody has ever come close frankly um i've seen him and by the way i, I almost feel like this is the only Superman film that he really gets to shine as an actor. I think um, they, they do some things with him in, in the other films, which is fine, but, the, but he's never really as parallel as he, as he is here. I remember seeing him in death trap. Do you remember that movie with Michael I, Caine? I actually like that. I actually like that movie. That's a great One movie. of the reasons I saw it was because he was in it. I remember yeah. the first time I saw that. I remember, I literally remember my grandmother and I watching that one night. Um, you know, it was my grandmother was watching it. So I got to stay up late and we were watching that. I thought that was fantastic. I thought he yeah. was excellent in it. Kalel, you do not remember me. I am Jorel. I'm your father. Even though you've been raised as a human being, you are not one of them. You have great powers, only some of which you have discovered. I'm pretty sure I know your score, <laughs> um, but I'm going to ask anyway. Joe, 1978, Richard Donner directed Superman the movie. Out of 10, what'd you give it? It gets all 10, my friend. This is honestly, like I said, this is this is a masterful film, and I and I. Again, I hate that it kind of gets dismissed as being a superhero film because honestly, I and again, I've seen documentaries about it and I've heard people, you know, the the filmmakers comment on it and they they would I mean, they were wise enough to understand that this is like our King Arthur. You know, this is like our 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 Greek myths. This, these are our this is our Hercules. This is our I mean, this is the the icon that we sort of grew up with and this was the correct treatment the correct way to uh to highlight and, and to to show to the world what this icon really was and again this was i i i feel like i'm overusing this term at this point this was a sweeping epic saga about this character and, and this film it, it really is just so masterfully done from the, I mean, again, you have Marlon Brando's uh, magnificent portrayal of Jor-El done as almost like a Shakespearean play, uh, all the way down to uh, Otis bopping down the street eating a candy apple, you know, and, 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 and <laughs> I mean, and all of it is done perfectly. So you really do get a, like a sweeping scale. Of so many different things happening in this film, and the the it comes together in such a masterful way. I mean, it's funny we know the story about Superman one and two was supposed to be filmed together. The turning back of of the world was supposed to be the climax of the second one, but right. somebody in just in a nervous in a moment of nervousness said, "Well, let's put that to the end of this one because we need this one to work." Excuse me, to work, um, and honestly. As much as there's a part of me that wants to criticize that move because it, it does chip away at the second one, <coughs> but it also Excuse makes me. this one 
a, a, a masterpiece, frankly. I kind of feel like that is this that was that was the perfect ending of this film. And I honestly, I'm not even really sure what the intention, what the original ending was, just to send the rockets out into space and to fix everything, and everything was done. I don't know. I mean, was Lois gonna die all along? I don't know what that was. A, you know, I, I don't know the whole story of that, or I forget it at least. Um, but honestly, the way this one ends, again, that moment of all those things I can do and having the flash. Jor-El's yelling in one ear. He's having the flashbacks of his Earth father. Uh, I mean, oh my God. I mean, it's just, that just sort of comes together so perfectly. So yes. yeah, I, obviously this film gets a 10 from me. I, I find this film to be absolutely positively flawless. I, 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 just, I really do believe that this is one of the unsung, I mean, like I said, it, it gets the credit for what it is usually as being like the, the, the godfather of the superhero films. I, I think this is a, a brilliant film across the board. I, I really do f- find that e- even as 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 much kudos as it does get, I kind of feel like that's not even enough. It's almost shameful the way it's dismissed in the term superhero movie because, yeah. yes, fine, it's about a superhero. But considering the superhero movies that we have today, it's not really in the same league. I love the Marvel movies, but this is... The best Marvel movie is still not as good as this movie because this movie has so much more to offer than just the fact that it's a superhero. It embraces that superhero. It doesn't shy away from it. it does, it's not insulted or um, embarrassed that there's a superhero in it, but it still tells a compelling story that could easily be told in the real world. Yeah. There is... Not a thing wrong with this incredibly flawless movie. And I looked for the damn flaws. <laughs> I really, really looked because I was saying to myself, well, I, I can't just come in with a 10. That's, that's, you know, but no, I'm coming in with a 10 because go. I could not find anything wrong with this movie. I tried. I really, really did. And I was even, I was even watching the can you read my mind scene with scrutiny thinking, this is it. This is where I'm going to find the <laughs> flaw. God damn it, it works in context. It works perfectly. <laughs> you know? Totally. It really does. Yep. I, 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 there's, there's nothing bad I can say about this movie. Not a single actor is off. Not a single moment is wasted. Not a single effect <clears throat> doesn't hold up to this very day. Mm-hmm. It amazingly still holds up to this very day. It's not perfect, but you, you know, there's that moment where you got to say, you know what, it's 1978. Give it a little bit of a break. And frankly, even the little bit of break I have to give, it still doesn't break my immersion into this movie. It's wonderful. It's perfect. And every time I watch it, I'm happier having watched it. I hear you. I totally hear you. I, I mean, honestly, even you know, even the effects as, like I said, this goes back to what I said about Raiders when I said, you know, you can see the difference between like the first Raiders and something like Crystal Skull. And the adversity that filmmakers have to had to deal with back then versus the the kind of you know the etch a sketch they have now of CGI can just sort of do anything they want. Um, mm-hmm. This is the same way. I mean, there are shots of him flying. The way they do things, the way I mean, the way they would film like him sort of c- like coming toward the screen as the background would drop away from you. Like those shots, I think are so great. And again, that's something that you would only get with uh, you know people trying to figure out how to shoot things you know in, in a way that that'll work cuz you don't have just infinite CGI and nonsense like that um the shot there's shots one of my favorite shots is when he first you know when he first when you know Lex luthor has got the kryptonite on him uh she rescues him he throws the kryptonite away and then that swell of music that duh, boom and he, like when he flies up crashes through the the ceiling through the roof and then there's a shot of him just like flying up from away from the city right and he mm-hmm. flies up towards the camera and kind of banks like like stops and banks to the to his right you know and he's flying over the Hudson River towards New Jersey and the way they do that the way he like it stops he stops and and banks and turns like that is a beautiful shot i mean again in in, in modern movies i mean you, he's like well we, we'll just have him just flying from here to there you know no problem here yeah. it's i mean it is a conscious choice this is art direction this is you know, when he like stops turns and the wind is whipping but his 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 body is kind of just slowly turning and the as, i mean that to me is one of those things like you, you'll never get that shot again 
You know, like that yeah. is something they did then. You'll never see it again today because it's too easy right now. But but oh my god, does it look great? And even then, when he flies off, like I mean, you could sort of say like, well, that looks a little bad as he's flying off, 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 and he's like. You know what? I don't care. It's like it's like it's just it's just too good. I mean that stuff like that. I just loved it. Um, it's honestly a case of, as far as I'm concerned, you take it for granted. Yeah, you wind up taking it so much for granted that you know these type of things uh, are possible. Right. So you know why you don't think about that? It's like ah, we'll just fix it in post. If I if I had a dime for every time I heard somebody say ah, we'll just fix it in post, I want to kill the person that came up with that. <laughs> why yeah. why not spend the time to get it right on screen? Agreed. All right. Well, we don't have a who asked you this week, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get right to for your consideration, which frankly is going to be almost as hard. <laughs> Joe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is for all the reasons we said. And honestly, there's so, th- th- like I said, this movie is just so damn good that it's hard to pick out just a few things to highlight. Uh, one, which I know you will get a, a giggle out of. Uh, I just wanted to mention as a runner up the comic accurate costume. Uh, <laughs> It's funny to me. Shocking. Yeah. I mean, it's funny to me now how, again, they look back at that with such disdain and, and they need to do everything different now. And the, the costumes have to have this funky texture. And I, I keep going back to that scene in Man of Steel, that weird interrogation scene when they're in the room, in the, in the bright white room, right, when he's in the handcuffs. And yet the costume looks almost jet black. And you say yeah. to yourself, "What? What? Like what? Is, again? This is a bright white room. That that costume should be glowing, but for some reason they are just so down on the idea of Superman that they they cover it up. You know, they 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 downplay it, color correct it, so there's no color left. And I find it to be so strange. Um, this to me was an era where it was almost a given that you would try to make as accurate a costume as you could do." And they just nailed this costume. And again, it's like, I know they would never do it again today. But there's something about that costume that is, it's so genuine. And again, it goes with the character because the character is a, a, a symbol of goodness, uh, of, of purity. You know, I mean, this, I mean, this film is about ethics, frankly, in, in many ways. And, and, and that costume just lends itself in a way that they, they it's like, you, you know, they didn't blink. They didn't flinch. They didn't say, dude, do you think this is going to work again? They understood why it worked and they just went with it. Um, that was a runner up, uh, the other runner up. And I'm telling you, this was, this was going to be my one, uh, the, uh, uh, again, you kind of know me by now. You sort of know what makes me tick the amazing story and screenplay magnificent Mario Puzo, the writer of the Godfather did the story and the screenplay. There was more contributions to the screenplay. David and Leslie Newman, Robert Benton, and the great Tom Mankiewicz contributed to this screenplay, which, again, I think is one of the, like, I think if you read this script, just read it from cover to cover without ever seeing the film, you'd be like, wow, this is this is a piece of work. Um, as great as that is, the one thing that I really had to just sort of say, you know what? I can't walk away from this film. This is the thing that always stays with me every time I see it. We talked about it. The amazing score by John Williams. I had to give it to that. And I just, I honestly said this and I, again, I already said it, so I won't get too deep into it, but I, I, every time I hear the score for this film, I, I literally marvel at such a magnificent piece of music, something that I literally can't even verbalize why it's so good it, it is there's something about this one again i think this is john williams best and he like i said he's got his his own competition is is his his it's it's just kind of awe inspiring and it works on so many levels and that i just i i i, I think i think it has to be my all-time favorite film score of all time and like I said, there, there's there's a lot of hot competition for that spot. I think this has to be the the best score in any film that I can think of. That I would use the term unparalleled. Yeah, 
I, I don't think there's ever been a score like it since or before, save maybe for the Gone with the Wind um, score. That might be the only other one that I could think of as most iconic. But he was my runner-up, and I was originally going to make him my number one as well, but I just had this feeling. I was like, you know what? Joe's going to make that his number one, so I want to <laughs> make sure I at least mention that. That's funny. Um, I also want to mention, uh, again, Christopher Reeve. I can't – I. I, I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. I can't not gush about this man's performance, and there will never be another one like him. But I'm giving the props to the person who I feel proved that without him, the Superman movies suffer. Uh, I know what you're going to say. I'm giving it to Richard Donner. The man absolutely deserves it. He had a plan, he executed it, he made changes as he went along, as he felt it was different, he, you know, when they wanted to do the big song for the scene with him, with the Can You Read My Mind scene, and he said, no, let's have Lois just say it. Mm -hmm. That was him. Yeah. And I will give him props for that. I really wish we lived in a world where Superman 2 was directed by him, because I really would have liked to have seen what he would have done. And considering the cascading quality of the movies from this point forward, he is sorely missed. So I'm giving it to Mr. Donner. I could not agree with that more. And frankly, I'm, I'm a little disappointed with myself that we didn't talk more about that. But you're absolutely positively right. And when you hear like when you hear the documentaries and the people behind the scenes and they talk about what they knew they had something special when he was there. There was a, a sense of family when he was running the show. And yes, you can obvious, very obviously see the quality uh, trip over itself, uh, you know, stumble when he's gone. And it's so like, I mean, well, this is, I mean, I, I won't skip ahead. This is our, you know, next week we'll, we'll cover it. But you're absolutely right. When Donner was in charge of this project, it was spot on. 100%. Sorely missed. But we'll talk more about how he's missed. In next week's episode, my friend. <laughs> yes, we will. Because next week, we are continuing the adventures of Superman as we will be reviewing Superman 2, back when they still use numbers for movies. Although, I guess Creed is kind of breaking that contention because Creed is, mm. you know, Creed 2. Yeah. But, but whatever the case may be, yes, we will be going on with Superman 2 and the Superman movies will just keep going. Uh, and going... And going <laughs> for better for or a worse. couple of weeks. <laughs> yep, for, for 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 better for worse. Some better, some worse. But we will discuss that. Yep. So we hope you enjoyed our review of Superman. We sure as hell enjoyed watching it. And I don't know about you, but I enjoyed talking about it with you too, my man. Uh, same here as always. And yeah, this was like I said. I watched this. I ended up watching this a couple times. And at no point did I kind of go, eh, "I've saw, I've seen this enough." Nope. If I had free time between the time you know, just in getting ready for this podcast, I threw it back on and watched it again i mean it was absolutely spectacular and yes absolutely fun to talk about this with you as always my friend all right well until next time we will be back for superman 2 next week ladies and gentlemen have a great night see you next week thanks for listening to the reviews without remorse podcast with joe and dave join us here every thursday for a new episode and be sure to check out the Reviews Without Remorse channel on YouTube and Vidme for spoiler-free reviews of new releases as well as in-depth discussions of current and classic cinema. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can find our page at patreon.com. As little as $1 a month goes a long way. All clips in this podcast are used for commentary and critique and is considered fair use. No copyright infringement is intended. When we get home... First thing that we're going to do is we are going to uh, find this boy's proper family. Oh, he hasn't got any. Not around here, anyway. Yeah, I do. Oh.